So we started with Isaiah chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. And last week, we ended chapter 3 with one, one amazing verse in chapter 4. I'll go over it in a moment. But he's, he's uh, chided, Isaiah has chided the men of Zion first in chapter 3. And then he also chides the women of Zion. And last week was an amazing, an amazing account of what the women were doing. And uh, he talked about the co-conspirators in corruption, co-partners in loss, and co-defendants in judgment. Let's take that last one as our review just a little bit and show you that curious verse that's at the end of it. It goes to chapter 4. Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war. And her gates, he's talking about, he's talking about Babylon coming in and destroying uh, Israel, Judah, and uh, Jerusalem because of their, uh, their arrogance and their, and their sin. And her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. And in that day, seven women, this is the verse, shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread, wear our own peril. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. So it's a very curious verse. Uh, basically, we last left Isaiah when he was rebuking these men of Zion and these daughter of, daughters, of, daughters of Zion. And he's warning them that impending danger is coming, judgment, because of their total abandonment of God and his ways. He tells the woman this that I just read to you in chapter 3. The last point is where we ended last week with a very cryptic verse. Uh, as we see it, he's saying that um, the men will be taken away. And that's what Babylon does. They take away all the generals. They take away all the rulers. They take away all the judges. They take away all the, all the priests. They take away anybody of importance. The Bible goes over it. The artisans, the orators. They, and what they leave is they leave the uh, bottom of the barrel of society as men. So there's so little men that we know that seven women want to take one man. Now they're going, even going against the, Levit the, going against the Exodus command that if you take a wife, you're supposed to provide for her income. Well, they're saying, we don't even want you to provide for her income. We just want you to take away our approach. We know Babylon's coming in. They're going to take them away captivity. The Syrians take the northern, northern ten tribes. The Babylonians take the southern two tribes. One at 720, 721 B.C. in the north. And we know that this one comes in 587 B.C. in the south. So it's lingered a little bit longer. But they take the men away captive. Their last king in the south would be Zedekiah. They actually put his eyes out and they drag him to Babylon. So uh, then in the, in the um, as we go on in the rest of chapter 4, in typical Isaiah fashion, he jumps past the upcoming destruction, which is a prophecy, to a time past our future today. So this is that duality of prophecy. Isaiah is this way. Sometimes the mountain peaks of prophecy. The present age, he's talking about, the, about how their rebellion is there. He will actually talk about some things in the time of Christ. I'll show you tonight, today. And then the future. So he, in a, just a verse, goes from his present age of their rebellion to the future, which is beyond you and me, which is the millennium. And Isaiah is the prophet that teaches the most about the millennium and the millennial age. So and yet again, in chapter 4, he jumps all the way forward to the millennial reign of Christ. Um, that we studied in chapter 2 in detail. Uh, so listen to the eventual restoration of Judah and Jerusalem. He talks about the punishment, but the jump is about the restoration. So listen to what he says in the rest of chapter 4. He says, In that day shall the branch of the Lord, this is the millennium, be beautiful and glorious. It's totally different than he was talking about destruction. And the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely to them that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remains in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even to every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, this is future, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment, by the spirit of burning. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and a smoke by day and the shining of a flame fire by night and upon all the glory shall be a defense. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for the place of refuge and a co for a covert from the storm and from the rain. It's a dual prophecy. He's saying that the temple is going to be reestablished the Shekinah glory is going to be back in. We know that happens. Nehemiah comes back and rebuilds it. But then it also is going to happen during the millennium. It's his full vision. He sees the millennial temple with the Shekinah in it. That's what Isaiah sees. Now again, people ask me all the time, well, is it going to have the Shekinah? Well, the glory of God is going to be there. So he's relating what he's seeing. So he's giving us the millennial view of Christ. I told you about it a couple weeks ago, so let me review it just a little bit for you because it can get kind of soupy. So we know that sin was judged on the cross. We know this. The, we know that we're in the church age right now. This is where we are right now. We know the rapture is going to happen. That's where we'll be judged at the Bema Seat of Christ. We also know there's a seven-year tribulation where Israel is judged. We know the Mount of Olives will split in half. It'll go from the, the north to the south. Christ will ride back with, after the marriage supper of the Lamb with us and he'll, he'll defeat the enemies at the Valley of Armageddon. Then Israel will become the head of nations. This is the thousand year millennium. Satan is bound for a thousand years and then he's loosed at the end of it. So after that, we know that there's the great white throne judgment. You don't get judged at the great white throne judgment. That is a judgment for unbelievers. It's called the second death. 
uh, it, hell gives up its dead, demons come up, they're cast into the lake of fire. Then we have, and the books are open, then we have the new heaven and new earth. So this is the final state, the final, the final uh, phase of mankind, if you will, when Christ sets up the new heaven and new earth with the new Jerusalem ruling uh, the universe, really. But this is the millennium, that thousand year millennium, where Christ rules from the, from the seat of David in the rebuilt Solomon's temple. Isaiah sees it. He sees it in a vision. He sees all about it. I'll show it to you a little bit more. So we know that the Old Testament age is here. We know the church age is right here. We know the tribulation is here. There's the millennium. There's eternity. Those, four, those five areas right there will tell you where we're headed. Uh, we also see it this way. You have the church age, there's the tribulation, reign of Antichrist, restoration of the Jews to Palestine, conversion of the remnant of Israel, temple rebuilt, priesthood sacrifice, cult ritual restored. So we know this is going to happen during that seven year tribulation. Antichrist is going to defile that temple, but Christ is going to purify that temple. Uh, then the millennium, Satan will be bound. Tribulation saints, the Old Testament believers raised, that's the rapture. And then we know Satan is loosed, he's bound, after a thousand years he's loosed. He actually tempts the people that are born during the humans that are born during the millennium to surround Jerusalem and a fire comes down, Second Peter says, and consumes them. We'd we'll give it to you one more time, and I know it's a lot. So you have from Adam to the cross four thousand years, the church age two thousand years. We have this tribulation that's happened in the thousand year millennium. Four thousand, six thousand, seven thousand years, perfect number. If you see it this way one more time, I just want to get you to get it. Church age. Then you have the uh, ends, you have the three and a half years of tribulation, mild tribulation, three and a half years of great tribulation. Antichrist is cares himself God here uh, by offering a sacrifice in the revealed Solomon's temple. Uh, the, it's called the abomination of desolation or the abomination that makes desolate. People ran away from it. The Christ comes, returns on, his, on the white horse with his saints, you and me, and then the millennium reign of Christ, thousand years. You will rule the people that are born here. You have been tempt are tempted every single day. These people will be tempted once in a thousand years. So the enemy knows who's the rulers. He knows that you and I are going to rule. You're going to be immortal. These people will be mortal. They'll be like Adam and Eve. They'll live for a thousand years. God never intended for us to go to heaven. Did he? He put Adam and Eve in the garden and, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. He never said you're going to go to heaven. He also didn't, he never said you're going to go to hell. When they sinned, they became as one of, one of them. Remember, they became, they understood, they were enlightened. So God had to send his son. He was the first one, by the way, to sacrifice a lamb to cover them, which was a symbol of them being covered eventually, their sin being taken away. So we are called a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. Why are we chosen? Because we're the ones that are going to rule. Most people have no knowledge of that at all. And basically, they have no understanding of it. This is why the enemy tempts you every single day, because he knows you're, ruler, you're a rulership class. And so um, that millennium is powerful. Uh, you're going to rule through that millennium in a, in a glorified body. These people will not have glorified bodies. These will be mortal. You will be immortal. It's not a fantasy. It's not a special effect. It's reality. It's what the Bible says over and over again. Um, it's a bad trade to give up God for anything in this world. It really is a bad trade. All right. The millennial, reign, the millennial Jerusalem. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be the center of the world. Um, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forward forevermore. Psalm 125, 2. It's powerful. It's all over scripture. Uh, Jerusalem will be re rebuilt. So um, that is the millennial Jerusalem. Then Isaiah tells us of a bittersweet love song. Now he's jumping back to the judgment. How many are following this so far? So Isaiah is like a, like a Mexican jumping bean. I remember when I was a kid, we used to get those. How many of you ever saw those? I don't know what made those things jump, but they jumped all over the place. Well, that's Isaiah's doing. He's going from the judgment of the present time, and then he's jumping to millennium. He's going to go to the judgment of the present time, and he's going to jump to the time of Christ in a couple, a couple uh, chapters. So he's going back and forth. So I want, to, I want to show you when he does that. Now he's going back to his reality, and he does something in chapter 5 that's pretty interesting. He does this. By the way, we just studied all of chapter 4. Chapter 5, a bittersweet love song. This is what he talks about. He's going to talk about a song of love. How much do I love you? Why don't you love me? What can I do? Then a chorus of woes. Six woes. Woe of greed, drunkenness, self-deceit, self-justification, sophistry, uh, injustice. And then God's fury and his flag. A devouring fire and an unfurling banner. He's right back talking to the, the, the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. Again, he's warning them. There's impending judgment coming. And he's warning them over and over and over again. So as he does this, and as we talk about it tonight, and as we study it, Think about America. There's amazing parallels to America in this. In our, it's a, so we get again Isaiah chapter 4 to chapter 5. 
And as he jumps back and forth, Isaiah has a problem. It's a problem similar to the one many people have today. It's one of rectifying God's judgment and his redemption. I remember when Mark, who's a great Christian, my son, our son is a great Christian man with a great family. I remember when he was living in Jerusalem and he was uh, going to Jerusalem University. And I remember he was living in a Muslim area on a, in a hotel uh, above the, by the Jaffa Gate. And he had a lot of international kids that were there going to that university. And I remember visiting him, Cheryl and I visited him, and he sat me down and said, Dad, I got some problems. I said, what's your problem, Mark? He says, God, God's judgment and his love. He says, you know, there's so many people that are going to be judged. He says, how do, how, do you, how do you rectify God's love and his judgment? And man, I could see that. I could see the confusion in his eyes. I could see, he says, you know, there's so many people that don't know. And, you know, if God is love, why is this going to happen? Well, that's Isaiah's problem, too. It's our problem also, by the way. His love and his wrath. It's really hard to rectify or to actually balance or juxtapose his love and his wrath. It's a debate in, his, in Isaiah's mind and in the minds of many today. How can a loving God also be a God of wrath? Okay, so let's get the hard questions right out of the way. Listen to it. If God's purpose is redemption and his promise is one of redemption, how can he justify venting his wrath upon his own creation and his own chosen people? I don't think a lot of people ask that question, but it's a, a very valid question to ask. It's a very valid. How can God do that wrath? I mean, it's not just something you just say, well, he does it. You have to understand it. So Isaiah offers what is called the song of the vineyard, and that's what chapter 5 is. In the verses, he sings of God's love for his people, and in the chorus, he proclaims the woes against their rebellion that justifies God's wrath. The point is, when they rebel over and over again and don't repent, in short, he's going to lift his protective hand and lead them to the consequences of their sin. God really doesn't have to visually, virtually punish anyone right, right personally. All he has to do is lift his protective hand, and punishment comes. And so that's basically what it has to do. Remember we told you? Man has a tendency towards evil. Uh, so evil is going to be perpetrated unless God's protective hand is there. So the first thing he asks is this. How much do I love you? And he tells them in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Now will I sing to my well-beloved the song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it. He gathered out the stones thereof. And he planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. So, as we look at this, just listen. He says, Now let me sing to my beloved. Reminds me of uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning's sonnet, How Do I Love Thee, Let Me Count the Ways. I did that the other day, for sure. I, I had to quit at 777 quadrillion, How Do I Love Her, so I just can't count any higher. But uh, how you love the ways, am I doing well or what? Thank you. How do I love you? Let me count the ways. That's what God's saying. Let me show you what I've done for you. Listen, though our feelings come and go, God's love for us does not. It never fades. And here's the hard part for you. Even in the midst of his judgment, his love for Judah and Jer Jerusalem has not faded a bit. That judgment has nothing to do with his love. As a matter of fact, it has everything to do with his love. Nothing to do, that's not the reason why he's judged. Everything to do because he does love them. See, God loves you more than a, in a moment than anyone could love you in a lifetime. So God's love is a constant. It's not anything that wanes. When he's judging someone, he's not stopping loving them. That's a big difference there. And so that's why we could see it. I have a Mark Corellian quote. You could throw them out the window after you hear them. Here they are. The most amazing thing about God's love is that even though we can never fully understand God's love, it fully understands us. And so he understands our ways. He understands when we're going to go astray. Then, with amazing detail, Isaiah, uh, he walks, off, walks us through the steps with an analogy of a vineyard. He says this, and listen to them. This is how God loves. God chose a fertile hillside. He clears the stones away. He plants the vines. He builds a watchtower to protect it. He cuts a wine press in an anticipation of a rich harvest of good grapes. All the work is done by God. And the result, it's all for nothing. The vineyard yields rotten grapes whose smell repels the owner. So he does all the work, and that's what comes from it. This is what, it's, it's love not returned. He's saying, I've done everything I could to love you. All of the love of labor is lost. So he asked the next question, why don't you love me? It's a good question we should ask our world today. Why are people opposed to Christ? Why don't you love me? Uh, Isaiah 5, 3 and 4 says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I've done? What else could I have done? He's given an analogy. What else could I have done for you? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, 
It brought forth wild grapes, or rotten grapes is one of the translations. So here's what he's talking about. He says, God asked the men of Judah and Jerusalem, what more could I have done uh, to my vineyard that I didn't do to it? You know, John 3.16 tells us this. It says, so God loved, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should have everlasting life. That is the quote in the verse that's the most powerful verse about love to the entire world. What, what more could God have done other than giving his son to the world? The question is a ring to, of Jesus' challenge to his accusers in John 8, 46. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? So God's telling him, I've loved you and I've given you everything. Why don't you love me? Um, here's the truth. Truth takes the throne here and falsehood gives way to the gallows. So the next question is obvious. What can I do? What can I do? He's asking. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do in my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof. He's lifting his hand away. Watch. And it shall be eaten up. I'll break down the wall thereof and it shall be trodden down. I'll lay it waste. It shall not be pruned, not digged, nor digged. But there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. Very, very strange here. Let me tell you why. Most of the time when you see a parable in here, you're never given the explanation. This one gives you the explanation. It tells you, my vineyard was the men of Judah. You were my pleasant plant. I planted you. I did everything I could. I hedged you about. I took care of it. took away all the stones. And, and basically, you paid me back with oppression. You paid me back with not loving me in return. You can't, you can't get any better description of how God acts against unrepented sin of his children than that. Bottom line for Jerusalem and Judah, as well as for Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as for New York City and America, as well as any sinful nation in the world, is this. Live in the continuous rebellion and unrepented sin and blatant sin. Reject God's love, and he's going to lift his hand. And it's a type of rejection. God didn't abandon the children of Israel. They abandoned him, and all he did was lift his hand away. The question today isn't about God abandoning our world, but about our world and has our world abandoned God. Here's a tough but honest chart for you tonight. We live in a time when boys think they're girls and girls think they're boys. And a bunch of people with depraved minds not only think this is perfectly normal, they encourage it. Though they know God's righteous decree of those who practice such things deserve to die, they, do, do them open, they only do them but give approval, they not only do them but give approval to those who practice them. That's Romans 132. So it's not about just politics and religion, it's God's word. You can't just reject it, God's going to take his hand off of it. And as he takes his hand off, then you're going to watch anarchy just kind of reign. It's seen it over and over again in scripture. What follows is 15 verses of woes, and these are tough woes. It's a chorus of woes, and here they are. Woe to the, of greed, the woe of drunkenness, the woe of self-deceit, the woe of self-justification, the woe of sophistry, the woe, the woe of injustice. So let's take them one at a time. Let's talk about the woe of greed. Here's what he's saying to them. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, for they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In my ears said the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of a homer shall yield an ephah. It means it's going to give them absolutely nothing. In each case, Jude and Jerusalem has made a decision to choose evil, and this type, to choose greed. First up is materialism through greed. The greedy have accumulated fields, he says, homes, mansions, vineyards at the expense of the poor. And that's the worst thing you could do. Greed really centers on selfishness. The mark of the inhabitants of Jude and Jerusalem was a self-centered selfishness resulting in widespread greed. When speaking about greed, I think this says it all. Greed is a fat demon with a small mouth. And whatever you feed it, it's never enough. I think that absolutely says it all. So he says, you're greedy. All you want to do is think about yourself and the things that you can have and you can accumulate. Then he gives them this. Woe to alcoholism. Woe to them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink that continue until night till wine inflames them. And the harp and the vial and the tabret and the pipe and the wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. He's talking about alcoholism or he's talking about uh, abuse, addiction. The use of alcohol and other narcotic substances is another text, test that the children of Israel failed. Now look, wine was not forbidden among the Israelites. It was okay for them to drink it. Communal wine and religious feasts and social wine at celebrations such as weddings uh, served as an enhancement of spirit on those occasions. 
Uh, you don't see any con uh, con uh, condemnation in Scripture about that for the Jews. But strict taboos prohibited the abuse of alcohol because of its destructive force upon personal judgment and social morals. He cites particularly the leaders of the nation who rise up early to drink and don't stop until they're done, until the night's done. They're addicted. Uh, when a civilization has a high addiction to alcohol or drugs, it's a sign, as Isaiah says, that they don't regard the work of the, of the Lord, nor do they, con uh, do they consider the operation of his hands. The same woe could be pronounced over our society today. Is America suffering from addiction? 42 states this week, 42 states, got federal grants to help with the opioid epidemic. Uh, Alabama got two of them. One of them was $400,000. Let me show you. He, he's, he goes on to say this. Therefore, hell has enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure in their glory and their multitude and their pomp. And he that rejoices shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down and the mighty man shall be humbled. And the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. And God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Then shall the lambs feed after their manner and the waste places of the fat ones shall strangers eat. He's talking about total destruction because of addiction. Uh, that, that addiction is pretty, is pretty specific that it's... He talks about alcohol, but it's also drug addiction. Let me show you this in America. This is the opioid uh, epidemic in America. N national drug overdose deaths involving any opioid, we have skyrocketed to 47,600 deaths in 2017. That's higher yet by another 8,000 today. So opioid levels, are we are an addicted nation. It's just unbelievable. Let me give you some of the stats. Um, 130 people die every day from opioid-related drug overdoses. 47,600 people died from overdoses on opioids. 81,000 people use heroin for the first time. 28,466 deaths attributed to overdosing on synthetic opioids other than methadone. 2.1 million people had an opioid use disorder. 2 million people misused prescription opioids for the first time. 11.4 million people misused prescription opioids. 866,000 people used heroin. 15,482 deaths are uh, attributed to overdosing on heroin. So we're an addicted nation. Now, we may not be addicted, but when a nation is addicted, it's a sign of something. Let me tell you what the sign is, that they've forgotten God. God does not condone any type of addiction other than you being addicted to Him. Somebody say amen. So when you don't, when you have no moral compass, now those things can happen for a lot of different reasons, whether it's accidental or whether they're escaping life, or no matter what it is, it's something that they're not trusting God for. It's a sign of a, of a nation that's going in decline. And that's what happened in Israel. So uh, the next woe is this one. Woe of self-defeat. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. I'm going to explain all that in another translation of this. That say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. The message tells it this way, and I like the way they put it. Actually, it's the Living Bible. Woe to those who drag their sins behind them like a bullock on a rope. They even mock the Holy One of Israel and dare the Lord to punish them. Hurry up and punish us, O Lord, they say. We want to see what you can do. It's self-deception. They think that God's never going to take care of them. By the way, I want you to understand that these things are pretty powerful. That's the woe of self-deception. Is, a, is an amazing thing. The third woe is about those who deceive themselves in thinking God will never punish their sins. And we have a whole bunch of them in America today. A lot of them in the, in the movie industry. A lot of them in, the, in, the, in stardom, if you will. The scene reminds us of a cartoon showing a white-bearded, long-robed prophet walking in the marketplace carrying a sign that reads, The end is near. And those who pass by laugh at the prophet because he returns each day with the same message and nothing happens. Uh, meanwhile, they go about their sins with a with a laughing passion. They say, come on, God, judge us. We want to see what you can do. It's very dangerous. It's very evil. It's very stupid. Bill Maher, how many know who Bill Maher is? He's one of the men that does that. Uh, um, Ron Reagan, uh, an atheist, goes on TV, has commercials, slapping God in the face, almost daring God, come on and judge me. We're seeing him all over America right now. And by the way, they're probably the dumbest people on the planet. And that's what God says. You, you're tempting me. Just because you haven't seen it, doesn't mean it's not coming. Then he gives the woe of self-justification. Woe to them that call evil good and good evil. Boy, think about your nation today. Think about what's happening. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. The woe of self-justification. What does it mean? Well, these are the crowd pleasers who feel the need to rewrite God's laws so everyone can be included. It's happening today all over the church. If pastors are doing it, they're condoning the LGBT issues. Uh, they're including everyone. They're calling good evil and evil good. 
And one time, um, here's one for you. I think I showed it to you before. Anybody know who that is? Who? Pete, Pete who? Pete Buttigieg, the mayor, who's running for president. Time Magazine said the first family, that's his husband or wife. Or I'm not, I get confused. It's one of them. But this is the first family. He, say, he calls himself a Christian. He's a Christian. Matter of fact, let me give you a quote. If you have a problem with who I am, your, your quarrel is with my maker, not me. That's bold. It's slapping God in the face. This, this scripture, 2,000 years of church teaching has, has condemned homosexuality. 2,000 years. Just because everybody thinks it's okay today or being crammed down our throats doesn't mean it's okay. 2,000 years. These are people who are, who are bold. They're the same sin that Israel was doing. So, woe to self-justification. Rather than speaking the truth without compromise, the teacher, leader, pastor, personality reverse the values so that the good becomes evil and evil becomes good. Do you know how many the pastors of megachurches I know right now are changing their opinion on homosexuality? How do you change your uh, conviction? How do you change a conviction of the Bible? It's because they're having pressure from people. And so basically they're not standing up for what's good. Uh, you change darkness becomes light, light becomes darkness, bitter becomes sweet, and sweet becomes bitter. That's verse 20, by the way. And then you can illustrate the moral uh, reversal in our present society. Someone said it this way. A thief in the night sneaked into the store and changed all the prices on all the items. The most valuable are now the cheapest, and the cheapest are now the most valuable. Sadly, today we live with just that reality. Sometimes even entertained by sin in movies and jokes all, over, all around us. Isaiah would warn us not to justify being around sin or amused by sin. Number five, pretty heavy-duty stuff, isn't it? Yes? Yes. yes. Woe of sophistry. Woe to them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Sophia means wisdom, by the way. And that's what this is. It's their wisdom. They have their own wisdom. So I'm going to get pretty technical with you. What is sophistry? Here it is. An argument that seems plausible but is fallacious or misleading, especially when devised deliberately to be so. The art of using deceptive speech or writing, cunning or trickery. Politicians love this. This, is the, this. this should be a description of politicians because most of them, not all of them, but most of them use sophistry to try to get votes. Let me give you an example of what's happening here. It's about intellect. Uh, academics who pride themselves on their own intellect will be, will, will be uh, the ones that are affected by verse 21, the woe that's given to them. Intellect. You, go, you send people to college, you send your kids to college, and those college professors think they know everything and they try to unteach Christianity. It's happening all over our colleges today. Look, people who are especially gifted with natural intelligence are often responsible for the ideas that are acted out by a society. There's not many genuine leaders in society. You're not, you have a lot of followers, not a whole lot of leaders. Here's a, here's a leader. Anybody know who that is? That's right, that, Vladimir Lenin. He came up with communism, he did. It was an, acted out by dictators such as Stalin and Khrushchev and Castro in Cuba and is still being acted out by Kim Jong-un in North Korea and Xi Jinping in China. Democracy as well was an idea acted out by Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln and other American presidents. The Founding Fathers called democracy an experiment. It's an idea that was acted out. Good wisdom, however, does not automatically come with high intelligence. When I was a kid, I did a lot of stupid things. That doesn't mean I don't do stupid things now, but when I was a kid, I did a lot of stupid things. And my mother, who was not really very intelligent, she really wasn't, she didn't have a real high IQ, would say to me all the time, Mark, you have a high IQ, but you don't have any common sense. She would constantly tell me that. By definition, wisdom means to see the whole picture. And that's what this is. These people don't see the whole picture. So how can we see the whole thing? Job asked that question in his book in Job chapter 28. He tells us where to find wisdom and where we will never find it. You know, it's almost worth reading the entire chapter, so I'm going to for you, all right? Okay? Can I? I'm asking permission. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm just asking permission. Living Bible. Or message, excuse me. We all know how silver seams the walk, comes in seams, and he's right. We've seen the stuff from which gold is refined. We're aware of how iron is dug out of the ground and copper is smelted from rock. The oldest book in the Bible. Miners penetrate the earth's darkness, searching the roots of the mountains for ore, digging away in the suffocating darkness. Man, what a description. Far from civilization, far from traffic, they cut a shaft and are lowered into it by ropes. Earth's surface is a field for grain, but its depths are a forge. Fire, how does he know that? How does he know that the inside of the earth is a fire? This is the oldest book in the Bible. Firing sapphires from stones and chiseling gold from rocks. He knows it's coming from the earth. 
Vultures are blind to its riches. Hawks never lay eyes on it. Wild animals are oblivious to it. Lions don't know it's there. Miners hammer away at the rock. They uproot the mountains. They tunnel through the rock and find all kinds of beautiful gems. They discover the origin of rivers and bring Earth's secrets to light. Pretty insightful. But where, oh where, will they find wisdom? Where does insight hide? Mortals don't have a clue, haven't the slightest idea where to look. Earth's depths say it's not here. Ocean deeps echo, never heard of it. It can't be bought with the finest gold, no amount of silver can get it. Even famous Ophir gold can't buy it, it's the purest gold you can get. Not even diamonds and sapphires, neither gold nor emeralds are comparable. Extravagant jewelry can't touch it. Pearl necklaces and ruby bracelets, why bother? None of this is even a down payment on wisdom. Pile gold and African diamonds as high as you will. They can't hold a candle to wisdom. So where does wisdom come from? And where does insight live? It can't be found by looking, no matter how deep you dig, no matter how high you fly. If you search through the graveyard and question the dead, they say, we only heard rumors of it. God alone knows the way of wisdom, to wisdom. He knows the exact place to find it. He knows where everything is on earth. He sees everything under heaven. After he commands the winds to blow and measured out the waters, arranged for the rain and set off explosions of thunder and lightning, he focused on wisdom, made sure it was all set and tested and ready. Then he addressed the human race. Here it is, fear of the Lord, that's wisdom. And insight means shunning evil. That is a powerful chapter when you think about it. He's talking about, Isaiah warns those who are wise in their own finite mind. History is replete with the tragic consequences of such arrogance. Whether it's Nitsky's philosophy of God being dead and masters over slaves or his attacks on Christianity and the fact that he said there were subhuman people, many of his thoughts the Nazis practiced in the Holocaust, or Lenin's theory of communism which enslaved Europe for over 45 years. Isaiah would also have little patience with, with uh, academics today who use political correctness as a hammer of truth and a source of their self-made wisdom. Like what happened this week at Harvard University. Harvard University fired two professors Ronald Sullivan Jr. and his wife Stephanie Robinson. Both faculty deans, both had tenure, both were there for almost 20 years. The reason? The students protested his decision to work on Harvey Weinstein's legal defense. Now listen to me, that's absolutely ludicrous in America. Harvey Weinstein, no matter what he is charged for, even if it's multiple charges, is entitled by our Constitution to legal defense and due process. That's what America is founded on, legal defense and due process. How can Harvard, who trains lawyers fire two people because of their constitutional obligation to defend someone. You know how? It's political correctness. It's the, it's the Me Too movement. It's, hey, my feelings are above the law, or my agenda is above the law. We'll judge whoever we want to judge, and we'll forget about the law. That's wrong. We're supposed to be able to have a constitution. And basically, we're saying we're going to satisfy our feelings more than anything else. It's their own self-wisdom. Harry Weinstein may be the biggest creep on the planet. He's still entitled to a, to a defense. Come on, someone say amen. And when Harvard says they're firing professors because they're defending him, that's the, the fiber of America has just eroded tremendously. Leaders who pretend to be wise without God as the center of their reasoning are particularly dangerous because they influence the young who act out with high energy and zeal their revolutionary ideas. The last woe is this one. Woe of injustice. Woe to them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteous of the righteousness, the righteousness of the righteous from him. Now, I'm going to share something with you tonight. It's talking about injustice that you don't know, but is very close to home with me. Um, the injustice, basically, it's a summary of all the woes before this sixth one. Isaiah, Isaiah is returning to a central theme. The loss of personal righteousness leads to social corruption and injustice. Drunken leaders who practice all of the sins of the first five woes. Bottom line, bottom out, and taking bribes at the expense of the poor. That's what he's saying. When I was a kid, growing up, I loved basketball. So I'd go down to our, uh, I'd go down to our local playground in the summer with my ball, and I would always come down there and try. And I was always younger, and I was trying to get into the games. There was always some older kids that were there playing. And I, got, I started to get very good, and, uh, and boy, they, they knew I was getting better. And uh, there was one guy particularly that was the, the leader. He was, he was vile. He had a filthy mouth. He was drunk. He was, and I was not really that... I, mean, I was still young. I wasn't that, that evil at that point. And this guy was just an unrighteous guy. He was just horrible. And he would try to make fun. He wouldn't let me play. He would say all kinds of nasty things. And uh, God bless you. And I would, I would continue to go down there because he really didn't bother me. Um, I know him. You don't know him. But I'm going to tell you about him. His name is Michael T. Cunahan. He was born April 21st, 1952 in my city, Hazleton, Pennsylvania. 
He's a convicted felon right now who received a law degree from Temple University. He served from 1994 to 2007 as a judge on the Court of Common Pleas. The last four years as president judge. In January 2008, Conham became president, uh, president judge of Luzerne County, Pennsylvania. That's where my city is located. He's currently serving 17 and a half years in prison for his part in a so-called kids for cash scandal. Let me tell you what it was. He was an investor in a juvenile detention home that had 236 beds. So whenever the juveniles would come through his court, no matter what they did, he would sentence them to the juvenile detention home because he got paid by the state for every single bed that he occupied. It never had an open bed. And he did it for years and years, along with a cocaine ring that he was running. And he was sell selling to those kids that were in that juvenile. These kids, some of them should never have had any, any type of time at all being spent. In 2006, the FBI was tipped off about Conahan, Conahan and nepotism in the county courts. That court also ordered the expungements of records of 2,401 of those juveniles. He unjustly sentenced 2,041 ju 401 juveniles who were affected by the judicial misconduct. On September 23, 2011, he was sentenced to 17.5 years in prison in order to pay over $900,000 in fines and restitution. I knew this guy was going to be bad the moment I met this guy. And basically, he was a smart kid, but obviously he used it for his own concern. This is what they're talking about. You, you, th you exploit the poor. You do whatever you can for that dollar. This is what was happening in, in Israel. And it's happening in America. Isaiah makes, so let me just tell you, it's a good rule of thumb. If you want to know if a judge or a politician is honest or not, um, compare his balance in his checkbook before he's elected, and then compare it again after he's elect he leaves office. Isaiah makes the connection between personal sin and social corruption. You still with me tonight? He ends with this, a bittersweet so love song. God's fury in his flag. And man, this is where it kind of gets interesting to me. God's a devouring fire is the first thing he says. Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so the root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust, because all these woes. Because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, it is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, his people. My anger is kindled against my people. And he has stretched forth his hand against them and smitten them. And the hills did tremble and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. He says he hasn't, just because he's done that, he's still upset with them because of what they've done. So two things here, two metaphors describe the coming judgment in Jerusalem and Judah. Fire, which is this, and chaff, which is something that comes from corn that's very combustible. And here's where we come to the to the, into a positive spot tonight. Like the rain that falls on the just and the unjust. The Bible says the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The fire of God falls on both the righteous and it falls on the wicked. For the wicked, it becomes the purging flame that consumes and devours the rottenness of sin. That's what we're talking about here. But for us, the righteous, if you believe in God tonight, who follow God, his fire is our source of empowering energy, like the flaming tongues of fire at Pentecost. It's the same fire. To the wicked, it consumes them. To us, it warms us and encourages us and energizes us. Imagine the fire of God burning at all time right now, like an eternal flame. For the righteous, it does not harm us. In fact, it serves as a source of warmth and energy. But for the wicked, who represent dead stubble, dry chaff, rotten roots, withered flowers, when they come in contact with the same flame, the fire of God turns into a raging inferno. The truth is self-evident. Sin brings judgment upon itself. And the thing that really kind of gets me is this last part, the unfurled banner. And he will lift up an ensign or a sign to the nations from afar and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary nor stumble among them. None shall slumber or sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latch of their shoe be broken, whose arrows are sharp and their bows bent. He's talking about the, he's talking about the Babylonians coming to destroy them nor the latches should be broken, whose arrows are sharp, and their bows bent. Their horses' hoofs shall be counted like flint, their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. They shall roar, they shall lay hold of the prey, and shall carry it away safe, and none shall deliver it. That's the captives. And that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold, darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. He's talking about the ultimate capture of them. He's talking about what's going on. This is above the consuming fire, God, through Isaiah, lifts up a sign to the sinners, an unfurled banner. It's an explanation of their conquest by the Babylonians, who will come swiftly, not weary, with sharp arrows, horses' hoofs hard as flint, like roaring lions, carrying off their prey, captives, and darkness. It's amazing to me, if you haven't heard nothing, hear this tonight. 
It's amazing to me the imagery of fire and a sign of judgment. The wicked and the righteous see the same fire. Look, jump ahead to the redemptive promise with the same sign. Isaiah will tell us the redemptive promise. Look, Isaiah 11. And he shall set up a sign, ensign, for the nations shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. What is it talking about? Well, what will it be? It's, it's this. It's the cross. It's a sign. The fire is the fire of his love. That's the sign, the symbol. That's what God has sent to all the nations. That's what he sent to us. Remember how we started tonight? How much do I love you? Why don't you love me? What can I do? Everyone has a love story. It's the Bible. It tells you how much God loves you and how far he went to win your heart. That fire, that consuming fire that takes away evil is the fire of God's judgment on Jesus when he hung on the cross. But now that fire has become the love of God through the cross. The cross is now the thing that brings us close to the warmth of God. See, loving God, really loving him, means living out his commands no matter what the cost. So when we talk about Isaiah and we talk about the judgment, God is mixing that judgment with his love. Aren't you thankful that you are not on the side of judgment today? Aren't you thankful that you have God's love? That the same fury of that judgment has an opposite side with the fury of love. No one ever will ever love you as much as God loves you. You know, when I was unsaved, and I'll close in a moment, when I was unsaved, I walked through Cheryl's office. She was 17 years old. I thought I knew everything. I could have probably given you every one of those woes would have, that would have been me. And I walked through, and uh, I was talking to her, and she was uh, reading a Bible. I think I've told this before. And she was underlining in it. She was on her break, and she was underlining it. And I said, and I never, I grossed out everybody in that place, but I never grossed out her. She was like 17. And I said, whoa, what are you doing? She says, I'm reading my Bible. Under. I said, you're going to go to hell for that. She said, what? I said, you're, you're, under, you're, you're writing in your Bible. You know, I was brought up a Catholic. You, she says, well, what's your favorite? She says, what, what do you mean? I said, well, you can't write. That's a holy book. You can't write in that. I said, you know, you're going to go to hell. She says, well, what do you do with the Bible? I said, well, we have it on our shelf, which we didn't, by the way. And she said, uh, well, what's your, favorite, what's your favorite book? And I said, the Bible, which... She said, no, I mean book in the Bible. I said, I said, the Bible is a book. I had no idea that there were books in the Bible. She said, what's your favorite verse? I said, what is a verse? How old was I? 19 years old. I never knew one verse of scripture. Not one single verse. And then she said something to me that rocked my world. I never heard it before. She said, do you know God loves you? I was like, what? And when she told me that, something went deep, deep inside me. And it hit something. And I looked in her eyes, and it's almost like I was looking into her spirit. And I knew it was, the, it was the most powerful, profound thing anybody had ever told me. Do you know that tonight? Do you know that Jesus loves you with a power and a passion and a flame that can't be put out? Tonight, I am so thankful I'm on the right side. I'm so thankful that that fire that consumes everything has consumed my sin and has allowed me to be somebody that's called a son of God, a ruler to be. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? Father, I just thank you and praise you tonight. I thank you for your power and your presence, Lord God. I thank you for your word. I pray, Lord God, that as we see this, Lord, and as we hear it and as we study it, Lord, that we realize that our burden is for those that are around us that don't know you. Touch us tonight, Lord God. Help us make a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.